Hi, my name is Tim Westergren. Welcome to this South by Southwest conversation. I'm pleased to be here, especially to be here in the company of Mark Geiger. Uh, Mark is a, a long-standing stalwart of the music industry, both the real world one and the digital one. And if there was one, one person I'd want to spend 30 minutes with to get smarter about music, it would be Mark. Uh, so I'm really pleased uh, to be able to be with him today. Um, he has, he's one of those folks who's really learned by doing. He's not just a pontificator and a theoretician. He's someone who's actually been in the trenches from the world of digital or uh, gigs, Lollapalooza, talent booking. I remember one time walking to his office at Warner Music and it was like being in the middle of a trading floor. He was feeling like six phone calls at a time, and offers flying everywhere. It was, it was pretty wild. He's also found Artist Direct, which was one of the very early, really one of the very first online sort of music retailers. It was ahead of its time. And that was quite a journey when it became when public. I mean, he's really been around the block and is now doing something really fascinating, kind of trying to pull together a consortia of lot of clubs to to sort of rescue live music. Uh, and hopefully post COVID that'll ever be able to see that flourish. Um, so he's really a, a, a very smart, insightful guy. And we, we, we wanted today to have a session that musicians would, would walk away with uh, some actual useful information from to help you guys navigate guys and gals and bands navigate this very complicated future ahead of us. I try to make this actually something useful. Um, and before I jump in, Mark, you know, maybe you just give like a little quick on your, you know, how you got started and all this. I mean, I know some of your highlights, but you know, when did it all start for you? Uh, when did you kind of get embroiled in this whole industry? Well, before you build me up even further, which is embarrassing <laughs> um, and, and humiliating, I'm kidding. Uh, Tim Westergren is one of my, my professors I learned from in the School of Digital, <laughs> the College of Digital Rock. Um, and if you were around and half as old as Tim and I are in the war of the beginnings of digital music, uh, you know, I studied Pandora and everything Tim, Tim did, so I'm honored to be here. Uh, I started in college and I was a computer science guy in college as well as, you know, posing as a student. Um, started as a promoter and a manager and a record star manager and on, on the radio. Uh, and then my career sort of took off because one of, one of them became a hit, which was promoting. I became an agent. Then I became a record company executive with Rick Rubin. And then I, I, I went on to the digital world and, and founded a, a company that I took public and failed miserably with. But it, it was, it was, uh, it tried to do a lot of the stuff or anticipate a lot of the stuff I think we're going to talk about today. And then I was obviously uh, at William Morris for the last 17 years and then a startup. Um, so you and I both have had have have had uh, roads that we can learn some of this stuff where it's going, where it's been, and 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 what the hope is for artists, right? So here we go. Yeah, we got our black eyes. Well, great. Um, so I'm going to start with kind of a little theory of the case, Mark, that I want you to sort of respond to, mm -hmm. and 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 it's this: I, I have a worry that <clears throat> the music industry is headed in a very unhealthy direction for musicians, and I think there are two real hazards that I see them uh, confronting. One is the fact that they do not own their fans. So fans online do not belong to artists. Uh, they belong to Instagram and Facebook by and large, and artists have to rent them. Every time they do something, they have to rent them. You want to post your Instagram followers, you can reach four or 5% of them for free and the rest you have to pay for. So they don't own their audience. And the second thing is their income is sort of secondhand income. You know, they earn money uh, as a share of someone else's business, primarily advertising, but also subscription. And it tends to be not very much, and it's not very much for the vast majority of artists. So I think they are in this very precarious position and have kind of been unwitting, un unwittingly enlisted in this process, spending these years, you know, building their Facebook likes and YouTube streams, Spotify streams. And, and I worry they've kind of given over their industry to platforms. And they need to change something in order to have a healthy future. So, what does that does that sound right to you? Um, how do you react to that kind of a statement? I'd love to get your kind it, of initial feedback it, on that. It, yeah. First of all, that we didn't practice either of these questions, so I'm kind of psyched because you threw me a couple of good ones. Um, so, thank you. Uh, screwed me up. I'm kidding. So, look, I think you're asking a rent versus buy versus own question. Okay, and I think that. I'm of many minds when we were doing an artist direct, the artist did own their databases and we were one of the first companies to have millions and millions of fans in a database. I think that artists 
are not professional database managers or marketers. So what to do with it and how frequently to message or communicate or how to communicate or how to work the database, how to sell them goods, how to do it and keep your taste and your ethics and your image intact is not something that most people who make music are trained for, okay? Seth Godin spoke to this for years. Um, <clears throat> I personally think renting versus owning is smarter because the platforms they're on, while you don't own the user, it has its own rule set. It has its own form that the users are expecting to get communication in. So there's an advantage there, plus there's zero cost, right? I think one of if you're savvy and sophisticated to your point and you want to not get left holding the bag, scraping your users, okay, and I, I'm going to speak to this on Spotify as well, all right, scraping mm -hmm. your users off of other platforms, if you think about it, Facebook, YouTube, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, I mean, all, Apple Music, it doesn't matter, pick your giant platform, Tencent, they are like uh, massive nets to acquire consumers. That's where the traffic is. That's where the customers are. Then you have ways that work across multiple artists to get them to follow you, subscribe, like various things. You know, Pandora, I used to remember telling stories about Pandora's thumb up, thumb down versus other likes mm -hmm. and what was stronger, but it doesn't matter. What matters is once you have indications of interest, do you then take advantage and say, hey, click here and you start to scrape your users so you can own them, you would never build them that fast. And obviously the other piece that they need to mm -hmm. take into consideration is ticket sales and, and the, the database generated from ticket sales. We used to do all those things, but they couldn't get to scale as fast as you can get to it on outside networks where you don't own. So my personal philosophy is what they used to call write once, pu publish multiple, and then have hooks, right? The first question is, can you manage that database if you did have it? If you had it in a giant Excel spreadsheet or database, what would you do with it? So the, I would have the artists ask themselves that. And that, do they have people who could manage it and, and grow it and, and make them stickier? If not, you might be smarter leaving it on, leaving all of those audiences on those discrete platforms and learning how to work them, right? Learning how sure, to serve the content. It's worth a trade-off. It's, it's worth a trade-off. I don't know. It's, it's not, a, it's not. That's right. So the point really is you have a zero cost of acquisition on other networks. Right. Okay. And then you have to figure out how to service them. So I think the question is a great question. It's just not a clear answer. It might be different for everybody. The good news is, is that while you have a fear of it, all right, and they control it, you know, the man is controlling the platform is da da da, and they're serving advertising against it. Look, <clears throat> YouTube has a rev share. You might not get that on your own. So that's one advantage on the YouTube side and other advertising sides. Cost of acquisition is another, all right? So I think this is a very sophisticated question you're asking, and one of the <laughs> things that's gonna get answered over the next few years. I don't think there's an easy answer here. I do think that being knowledgeable and sophisticated about all the platforms, what you can and can't do, privacy regulations, and how to scrape, and, and what you would do if you had that database is critical, right? And it'll get to the other piece we'll talk about later, which is what do you do with those people once you have them regardless, well, right? Well, but, let me ask, let me ask a corollary to that, you know, um, yeah. we mentioned, you know, Daniel X comes quote a little while ago, he got hammered for so badly about artists need to make content faster. And I yep. think the underlying complaint was, wait a minute, we're being told by these big platforms how to, you know, how to pursue our craft. That's just, you know, not right. You don't know how music is made. Um, so. I, I, ha I have a feeling I know what your answer will be to this, but what about that trade-off? You know, like I, I want to make an album once every two years and like, these platforms are forcing me to do art in a way I don't want to. Like, you know, what do you think of that? Look, that I, sort I, of debate? I, 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 I think this has been going on for a long time, right? And I think that um, you and I coming up in the era when, when you started what was a seed of a playlist, right? Which would auto play that deconstructed the album already, right? And, and mm -hmm. made it a compilation ongoing. So we used to say that when music went digital, it was gonna to go to an infinite palette. Now, Daniel X said something about putting more content on Spotify, but what he really meant was more content to feed your audience, including, okay, grab, gathering more streams. So, you know, that may be just instead of releasing an album, you release 10 songs and then you drop the album. Now you have 11 bytes of the app Spotify spread out over time. 
that is what he was talking about. You need more hits to the system because it's a big library that the music's going into. I think if you think about it and you expand what he was saying, already artists for the last 15 years have needed to learn how to create more content than they did in the old world when they did a photo shoot and go on a tour and do a couple interviews or a few bunch of interviews. Now they have to be on Spotify or on Facebook every day. They have to post something on YouTube. They got a tweet. They're already making more content. Mm. It's not just music itself, right? And it's also how to release music. I was talking to an artist the other day and you know we're in an interesting era we'll talk about, but why does Spotify get all the music? And I think it's a great platform. I love the infinite jukebox. I, I think this is where the world was always going to go. But artists, it's early days. They can they can put they can window content. They can put two songs on Spotify, light up the world, put five songs on Bandcamp, put it on Patreon and uh, and and we'll get into those things and then release the rest of the music to Spotify after they've monetized it for a certain set of windows. We're at the very beginning of learning how to for artists to make money. You asked a second question and uh, I forgot what it was. We were talking about users rent versus own. And you said the second and income, is, second hand income. Yeah, second hand income. That's what you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, I mean, I want to, before you, I want to, I want to jump to another question. You, you go. Made me think about yep. it, you know, because, yep. so you signed an artist, you know, um, and you're having your orientation meeting, sit in the conference room or in your living room and you say, okay, buddy, Here's the plan. What, like, what is your, what is your kind of, you know, first conversation with the artist? Like, what do you say to them about what's ahead? You know, how to prioritize what, what them, what, what you're expecting of them, what they need to do to make you happy as their new manager investor. But what's the, what is that? What's the, what's the Mark Geiger 101 for the new, newly signed artist? Well, two things. One is the artist has to be great, right? And the music has to be great because there's no life. It, it's not worth going into if it's not, right? Two, you got to get everybody on the team together because if you know the music business, there are, there's a team, there's an accountant, there's a lawyer, there's a manager, there's an agent, there's a this, there's a that publisher, there's a record label. And they kind of have to be in sync because otherwise it's a worthless conversation or at least somebody's got to coordinate it. That being said, I look for what they've already done in their community, right? And I don't mean their local community, I mean their digital community and how, what are their skills? So if you're looking at an athlete, or a baseball player, can they run? Can they bunt? Can they hit? Can they throw? Can they field? Okay, if they make great music, can they communicate with their audience? Do they have an open mind about where the world's going? Are they old school only? Are they capable of, uh, can they, they're, all those things you're looking for. And more important, are they open minded? Do they understand that we're in a dynamic, hugely changing uh, for 25 years, right? The ground went from physical to files to streams to now exploding into a hundred different things that have to be done. So the digital awareness has to be high, right? And the digital open-mindedness has to be high. Yeah. Um, and I think all of that gets gets looked at. You know, do they not want to travel? Oh, I'm not going to get on a plane, I'm a germ foe. Okay, I can't promote you in Europe. <laughs> I'm just all these things. So I think there's a lot in this. But I think open mindedness and an understanding, you know, there's that book, Who Moved My Cheese? Well, the music business, cheese has been moving for 25 years. <laughs> and for you and I, or, who have been sort of in it that mm -hmm. long, and longer, I should say, um, understanding what the current change is and what to do, it may, have, it may be of that moment, right? So a so lot think, of it is think where are we now do, in you history. Think it's, do you think it's table stakes now for an artist to be sort of what we, what you would, and I would probably call hyper exposed. Like you gotta be around a lot, maybe not 24 seven, but you gotta be out there. Um, no, I think lot. you have to have a strategy. I, I think frequency is one of the dials. Okay. So when you say a lot, does that mean you're on every platform four times a month or every day, like a Twitch streamer, right? So I think part of the question to ask is what is the artist tone? What is their artistry and image? And then what's the frequency, right? What's the platforms? And then what's the content types? I think that's a very, unfortunately, analytical product way of looking at it. But that's kind of what the music business did. It exploded into a bunch of platforms that can handle a bunch of different forms of content, not just a song or an album, right? right. That's not really what we're talking about. When you think about where the world I think is going and that chat is going to get monetized. Messages are going to get monetized. Custom things are going to get monetized. You look at a platform like 
masterclass, lessons or, 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 or cameo, a birthday greeting or a lesson is going to get monetized. Access and communication gets monetized, you know, is how a lot of people make money. And, you know, what people are learning is they have 10 different segments to their audience. Some are passive, some are passive plus, some will go to a concert, some tune in and want to chat with the artist, someone chat with the artist and hang out every day, you know, and every artist is different. So I think, you know, one of the things I've been really thinking about in, in, in all of this is when you ask, and I think the question was, how's an artist going to actually make hmm. money? I kind of feel like uh, ever since the browser hit or even AOL before then CompuServe, there's been an increasing tool set and you got massive consumers digitally and you have the artist on the other side and it's a dance and they dance with each other based on what products are available, what the consumers want. And it's really evolving. And I think this next level is going to really freak a lot of people out because monetizing communication is not something that hmm. people have, you know, it's not like they went out and signed an autograph in the old days and got paid for it. You know, that happens at a Star Wars convention. It didn't happen backstage. So, but that is coming, <laughs> right? And, and monetizing your ringtone. There, there is, um, there's going to be a hundred different ways to make money. Some are going to be looked at as distasteful. Some are going to be looked at off brand, but I think the knowledge of where we're heading, right? We went from a physical to, as I said, to a file, i.e. Napster and iTunes, to a now stream. And I think we're going into a post Spotify earning era. You and I were talking, I, I'm calling it the era of artist digital monetization or digital artist monetization, whatever you want to call it. But it's an era and it's a wave. And you know, when you look at Audius and user centric pay models, and then you look at Patreon and you look at Twitch and you look at all the different ways in, you know, Tencent, in, in stream monetization, tip jars, you know, this is all going to impact artists a lot. And um, yeah, I think, I, I think what, that did, th 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 sorry, this, well, two no, things. No. One, I love this notion of the monetizing communication, which is like you said, that's just part of it, right? For artists. Yeah, and then, right. and I think you're, you're drawing this distinction between, you know, there's the era of digitization, but then there's the era of digital monetization. And we are of just tools. entering the latter right. of those two. And, that's right. right? And, that's and, right. And, and, and I think that's, you're, like, people are like, okay, we're here, but shit, well, how do we make money now? You know, like, and, and I think that's what you're saying that. Uh, it's this, all this those tools are coming. Yeah. Shopify, right? right? I mean, you, when you think about how hard it used to be to do e-commerce and now 12 year olds are shipping, you know, shoes to China and making a ton of money or, or kids are buying stock on Robin hood. You, you, you gotta look at this, in my opinion, like an, uh, a store. And that feels crass for an artist. If it was a record store, it'd feel romantic. So now the store can have records. You can have vinyl and ship it and make money off it, right? You can do everything old school, new school. You can carry other things. You can put, you know, a birthday greeting as a product. You can put a lot of things crass or not crass, join a private concert, right? And, and, and pay-per-view it. It's only 20 people. Um, the point is, is that artists to make money in the future will have to get a little more sophisticated and open-minded about what their store looks like. What do their fans want? And think about it from a, a fan's point of view. And now they can do it on anything from, a, as I said, a, a digital product, a communication product, a physical product, a made to order product, you know, print at home. Um, I, I'm watching a lot of artists do different things. And I think the biggest thing is to learn from other artists because every artist is pushing their own agenda in ways they feel comfortable. And then, you know, an artist manager team is going to make a custom recommendation once they understand the tool set. So to your, your point, Mark, uh, interestingly on sessions recently, we had an artist to perform and uh, during her show, we turned on this paid chat feature that allowed people to pay to chat. And she had 4,500 paid chats in less than an hour, just to pay to chat, not to be responded to, but just to chat. Uh, you know, that blew my mind. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, I get it. There are lots of ways to do this, um, you know, but you're talking to an artist like it's overwhelming. How do you get started? How do you help, how do you onboard into this, what you're describing as this digital monetization, all these different, to, 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 to give some advice. Well, the first thing you did was you sort of just laid out an example of what monetizing communication is going to look like, right? I know people are selling their WhatsApp number for $1,000 and the ability to chat with them. So that's part of 
the digital sweep of products to come, right? And it's going to expand from there. The way to start is first, you got to make music. You got to make great music. Second, you really got to figure out who are your partners here, who are your team, your manager, your agent, you this, if you can get one, if you can't, then figure out how to divide the labor with a friend or your bandmates if, if you're in a band, whatever. Number two is you have to define your look, your style. Who, who's your camp? What artist influenced you? Uh, what, what's your local community? And then you have to build channels, all right? Your Facebook channel for your artist or yourself, if it's the same thing, your band. Um, your Instagram channel, your Twitter channel, your, you got to film content, put it up on YouTube your Snapchat channel, all of the platforms, and then you got to figure out CD Baby or TuneCore to upload your music or AWOL or whatever it might be. So, and, and most artists start on SoundCloud, right? They post on SoundCloud and they try and get a community. So basically you have to figure out yourself and your art. You got to figure out a team and then you have to build the basic channels on all of the platforms. That's the first things to do. Then you follow the audience. And then you promote and market and promote and market might be following or posting your content alongside of other communities that are similar to your music, which obviously Pandora did, right? That's what it based itself on. So I so think those would be the steps Get out there on to all take. the channels. All the channels. All, and and then then don't don't have to be an expert. That's right. right. That's exactly right. All right, Mark, I think we run out of time, but it could go on. But thanks a lot for great spending time with you. And we'll talk more, you and I. My pleasure, Tim. Be good. Be well. All right. Thank you.